If you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We're beginning now a series on the church and the doctrine of the church and how important is the church in this day. And we see that the birthday of the church, the church has um, a definite beginning and a definite end. We know that the beginning is in chapter 2, where John had said, John the Baptist, back in chapter 1 of the book of John, tells us that, uh, yeah, he baptized with water, but uh, the Lord Jesus was coming, and he would baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And we see that uh, the Lord Jesus quoted that passage in Acts chapter 1, and we see that he says uh, in verse 4, he says, you have heard from me that John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so we see that the Lord told them to wait after he ascended and that he would be coming and the Holy Spirit would fill them um, on the, if they, as they would wait in Jerusalem. And we know that would be the day of Pentecost. Now, the day of Pentecost is very significant in the Jewish calendar. Actually, the first Pentecost was celebrated at Mount Sinai. The uh, the uh, Israelites had gotten to Mount Horeb or to Mount Sinai, the, that range there. Uh, Horeb was the uh, was the mountain range, and uh, and Sinai was the peak or the the specific mountain where. We know the Lord delivered the law, and then he set up the nation. And it took a year for them to do that. Um, and we know that as you read the book of, of Exodus, they got there on the second month, and then they didn't leave uh, Sinai, uh, according to the book of Numbers, until the second year. In, uh, in the third month. And so they were actually there about 13 months. But during that time, the Lord... Uh, codified, in other words, he wrote it down, and of course the Ten Commandments and the law, and also set up the law for the nation and, and the whole law book, um, the social, the uh, judicial, the uh, the theological uh, book that he set up for the the Jews and how they were to manage themselves when they got to the Promised Land, and so that took a year to to take a a bunch of ex slaves and to organize them, and to get them ready to move, and to have a government ready to be set up whenever they were given the promised land, the land of milk and honey. And so we see that the Lord took that time, but uh, the but we know that he set up three specific uh, days that the children of Israel were to remember um him and to especially the feast days. They were the feast days when they would get together, and that's one of the things that kept the nation together. Of course, the first one was Passover. And if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, you'll see that the whole calendar was set up on Passover. Actually, the Lord set up a calendar, uh, and the first, the day of the first month began the planning of the, of, of the Passover. And then, after the Passover and the Passover feasts and so forth that they would have, and that would be about a week long uh, time. Then you had another series of feasts uh, 50 days later, and that's where we get the word Pentecost. Actually, it's a, a Greek name, Penta, is, uh, and Pentecost is 50 day, 50th, meaning 50th day. And of course, it was um, the Feast of Weeks, it was also called, because it was a week of weeks, seven weeks and one day after the Sabbath of, uh, of um, Passover. And so we see that uh, this was a very significant time in the Jewish calendar. And this would be the one time and the most popular of all the feasts because this would be the, the best time of the year for people to travel to Jerusalem. And we see in Acts chapter 2 that there were people from all over the world that, that were there in Jerusalem as they were participating in the Feast of Weeks or the First the first Fruits, uh, the Feast of First Fruits. It was a time when those first wheat harvests would come in and they would make their cakes and so forth. And it was, of course, uh, the unleavened bread of the of um, of. Passover. Now it was a feast, uh, uh, carrying on that uh, tradition. Now with uh, uh, with 
the first fruits and the promise of things to come. And then uh, later on in the year, in the fall of the year, they would have the Feast of Tabernacles, and this would involve the Day of Atonement, which would be uh, Yom Kippur, late September, 1st of October, or somewhere around there, uh, where we that was a very important day for them for the for the Day of Atonement, and so we see that those three feasts are extremely uh, important, and it's one of the things that uh, the whole cultural, the whole social fabric of Israel was built around, and so this was a very significant day, and so we see now that the Bible tells us in Acts chapter two, verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now that's a very interesting phrase. The, the idea of the, Pente- the day of Pentecost fully coming is like a mother giving birth. Her time is up and now it's, she's ready to go to the doctor. And it was the birth of something. And I remember <laughs> I was kidding my wife, uh, when we were having our children, our first child, and uh, it wasn't all that bad. I mean, as far as she was having contractions, and we were wondering when to go. And uh, she even wanted to stop at McDonald's to get something to eat, which we found out later on was not a good idea. But uh, uh, we just were on the way, and I kind of looked at her slyly, and I said, uh, Honey, I said, Sweetheart, are you sure you want to go through with this? And so, of course, uh, you were going to go through with this. Your day had fully come. And so that was the idea of the Lord now giving birth. I mean, how some new organism, the church is not an organization, it's an organism. It's a living being. It is a body of Christ. It is, it is his manifestation of the Holy Spirit uh, in the world today. Now, of course, uh, being human, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, the church is only the church as long as it presents Jesus Christ in his purity. And there's a lot of places calling themselves churches today that have ceased from... Uh, from the truth a long time ago, and now they are actually uh, so much of the world that as in the book of Galatians, Paul says, you're not uh, worshiping uh, another Christ, or you're not worshiping the same Christ, you're worshiping a whole different Christ, and you're just naming him uh, Jesus Christ. And so you're worshiping a false Christ, and there's a lot of false Christs and a lot of false churches today. And so we see that uh, in the, the day of Pentecost had for, uh, fully come, it had come to fruition, um, and they were all with one accord. Now remember Acts chapter 1, we see that there were 100, 120 people, including Mary and a lot of the other ladies, as well as the apostles, and they had gathered together in one place. Now we're thinking uh, now that uh, possibly, since they've been waiting 10 days, and this is Pentecost, there were 30 different rooms in the temple for assemblies. And many people believe that now the church uh, had grown, or that the people and the the people who were waiting for the Lord, for the Holy Spirit, as the Lord told them to when he ascended, were now expanding, and they had gone to the, actually to the temple. You will see through the book of Acts, that the church keeps coming out of the temple. And that's one of the things, the reason we call the book of Acts a transitional book, because you're pulling it out of the Old Testament, out of the Old Testament form of worship, into a whole new way of worship. And that's why you have to be careful with your doctrine in the book of Acts, because you're dealing with coming from a Jewish social uh, and a theological central uh organization or or organism to a whole new birth of a whole new organism called the church, which God would officially say, this is uh, the way you're going to proclaim the gospel to the world is through the church and not through the Jewish nation. So we see that this was all transitory and uh, it had a lot to do now with a lot of the things that we see in the book of Acts that many people uh, think that we can go back to, which were really... um, Things, especially tongues and so forth and baptism. Those are all things that, uh, that the Lord used, uh, or that were, uh, symbols that we see that, uh, were transitory. And we'll talk about that in a moment, especially in the area of tongues this morning. Um, and what, uh, what does it really mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And so we see that it says, then suddenly there came a sound of, from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. 
And it was fill, and it filled the whole house. And was it the temple or was that upper room? If it was the upper room, it, it contained 120 uh, people. Uh, somebody had to be pretty wealthy in that church. How many of you people here have a house where we could put 120 people of our congregation into your upper room? Very few. I mean, we, some of you might have a barn outside or whatever, but uh, this had to be a pretty big house. And so, of course, then we see later on they're preaching to many people and 3,000 get saved. So obviously, somewhere down the line, they moved from the upper room to the temple. And so many people believe that they had already moved to the temple, and this was the whole house or the whole room that was filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice it says, and there appeared, um, uh, let's see, the whole house was, let's go back to verse 2. It says, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they, there appeared to them divided or uh, cloven tongues, as King James says, tongues as a fire, and one set upon each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your word this morning. Help us to understand and to practice your word. May we be doers of the word and not hearers only. Thank you for the great gift of the Holy Spirit and your plan of the ages that uh, you tell us to go and preach the the gospel to a lost and dying world. And we're to be true in Belvedere and and, uh, our Jerusalem, in Judea, uh, which is our Boone County, in Samaria, that's uh, our country and uh, our our, our whole region, and uh, to the uttermost parts of the world. And so, Father, help us to, to carry forth this mandate but we know that we can't do it any more than the early church could do it without you. And they totally depended on you. And as a result of that, you filled them and you used them. And they continued and they turned the world upside down. And so, Lord, we know that uh, this was a very special place and a very special event in your calendar. And we know, Lord, that... Uh, you have promised, and you promised the Lord Jesus, you promised before the church began that you were coming again for that church. And so we're looking forward to that day. So, Father, how we pray now that you would bless this time that we have together. May we have understanding as we look into the great plan of the ages that you have here in the book of Acts. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Lord Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. Now we know that the Lord Jesus has no end or no beginning. In the beginning was the word. He was already there at the beginning. At the beginning of what? At the beginning of the world. At the beginning of time as we know it. And so we see that uh, there was a definite beginning of the world. And the Lord, uh, the book of Revelation tells us he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of the end. And so he was here before the church and he'll be here after the church. But he also designated, notice now he's writing there in, Re- in Revelation chapter one, the beginning and the end. He knows the beginning of the church. And he told us, and we see it here in the book of Acts, and he knows the end of the church, and we know that as we study, because he tells us that he's going to come for his church in what we call the rapture. And so in the first Thessalonians chapter four, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be, uh, we shall all be changed. Uh, that's, uh, first Corinthians 15, two, two passages there. Uh, first Corinthians 15 and first Thessalonians chapter four tell us about the coming of the Lord Jesus for his church. And so we see there is a definite beginning of the church, and there is a definite end. He is our Alpha and our Omega. He is our beginning. He's, a, he's the all-existent one. He's the one that we worship today. He's the same yesterday, today, forever. And so we see the Lord Jesus now is our everything. He's our A to Z. And so we everything is wrapped up in Him. And of course, he promised us as the third person of the Trinity who would glorify him, who would point us to him, who would uh, empower us to serve him and to reach a lost and dying world. And so we see that that's what he promised in the, the person of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes and we see now... It,
going through the book of Acts again, that yes, uh, and someone has said it's not the acts of the apostles, it's actually the acts of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we worship and we honor the Lord Jesus Christ. We call ourselves the church of Jesus Christ, not uh, the, these other, the true church of Jesus Christ. And we hope that there are other bodies of Christ out there that are honoring him, that are the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, that, uh, But we're not the church of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit says, I will glorify, or the Lord Jesus said, he will glorify me. So it said, the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. So he is our first and our last. He is everything. And yet we see that the, the Holy Spirit, the third person, points us to him. And so the Spirit bears with us with our spirit, that we are children of God. And so the Holy Spirit lives within us. And that's one of the things we see here in the setting that we have here. We see when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 50 days after, we see that this is the people had gathered together from all over the world uh, to to uh, at this very popular feast day. And uh, as a result now, we see that, uh, that notice it says that uh, they had fully come, that they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven, not the wind from heaven. Now, we see this several times in the Old Testament. A once a significant time you'll see is when the Lord is helping Elijah recover from his lapse of faith. And we see that he took him up, and actually he was on, uh, he was up probably on uh, the, the Mount Sinai. From what we, uh, uh, to say he was on Mount Horeb, probably right back in the place where the, uh, the law had been given to Moses. But we see that the Bible tells them that there was a rushing wind or a tornado, but actually it filled the mountains. But here we see that this wind was the sound of a wind. And they didn't want to blow down the temple. The Lord didn't want to blow down the temple or whatever. And so we see that it was the sound of the wind. And uh, so if you've ever been in a hurricane or a t- tornado, one of the, in my early ministry, uh, I was in Mobile, Alabama, and uh, actually I remember the date. It was September 12th, 1979, and we had Hurricane Frederick come through. Well, I was a Florida boy, and I knew all about hurricanes. I'd been through several of them, you know, and all that. They were, by the time they hit the Orlando area, they were 80, 90 miles an hour at the most, and you could pretty well weather them. They had, uh, a few trees would be knocked down or whatever. But I had no idea what the difference between an 75 or an 85 mile an hour wind and a 120 mile an hour wind was. And my, that was one of the scary, it sounded like trains. I mean, it sounded like a train, those big gusts of wind. And then later on, I found out, I mean, some of those trains were tornadoes. And those tornadoes had ripped through the area, and we actually lost 34 trees right around the church property there. And uh, we lost our roof and everything else. And here I was, uh, dummy me. I was a single guy at the time. And uh, I stayed in the church, and I had big old 55-gallon garbage cans filling up the uh, from water and everything. And I was saying, Lord, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done. And the, that was the last time I've ever stayed in a hurricane. I've always left after that. But uh, but wind is downright scary. And so we see that there was a sound of a rushing or a mighty wind. Now, when you see those terms in the Bible— Think of overpowering. When it talks about the sounds of mighty waters, think of a waterfall. And if you've ever been around a waterfall, you'll just, just the power of those things are downright threatening. And so we see that they, they were overcome with this sound of the mighty wind. And notice also it says, and they were filled. So that the wind, uh, in the Bible represents power, wind power. And of course, the Holy Spirit, uh, the breathing of the Holy Spirit is, we call that inspiration. And so we see, and they were, they filled the whole house and there they were sitting and they were, uh, and there appeared to them divided or cloven tongues of fire. Now notice that these cloven tongues of fire sat on each one of them or filled each person there, but it was only one fire. And fire represents, again, the presence of God. Think about Moses in the burning bush. Think about the fire, again, on Mount Horeb with uh, Moses and the law. Think of fire 
uh, with Elijah as he came back to Horeb. And we see that there was wind and fire uh, that the Lord uh, just showed him that uh, I can do all this, uh, Elijah, but I'd rather speak to you with a still small voice. Now, that's the way it is today. The Lord doesn't want to have to cause a hurricane to get your attention. The Lord doesn't want to have to hit you with a heavenly baseball bat to get your attention or fire down from heaven, uh, hit you uh, lightning strike next to you to get your attention. He would rather talk to you through a still, small voice. But here we see that uh, he was changing things. And most of the, and the times in the Old Testament when God drastically changed things, you see that he used drastic measures. Uh, at the giving of the law, there were drastic measures, and those people were scared to death of the Lord, or they were at least awestruck by what he was doing. And here we see in Acts chapter 2, again, God was changing things. He was changing his his. Uh, dispensation, as you call it. He was changing, uh, uh, dispensation literally means order of the household. He was changing the furniture. He was changing, he's same God, but he was changing things around. And no longer would it be the tabernacle or the temple that where the Lord dwelled, but it would be in the temple of a person's heart. Notice the Holy Spirit came and touched each one of them. In the uh, Mount Horeb, the the Lord, Holy Spirit came down and filled the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory. But here we see the cloven tongue that divided that Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit came down and touched each one of the people. And that's why we say, as Christians, we have uh, what we call the priesthood of the believer. We believe that each person here, each person who is, a, is saved, has the Holy Spirit living within them. And they should be guided by the Holy Spirit, which will always lead them to the Word. We'll see that again also. But we see that there appeared to them divided tongues of fire uh, as a fire, and it sat upon them, or each one of them. And so this wasn't something that Peter got and then he distributed, or the apostles got and they distributed. No, this was something that God did to each person. And that's what we want in our church. We want each person. I cannot fill you with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I every once in a while I'll listen to a uh, message from a fellow who's pretty good preacher in certain areas, but he's really off on this idea that he will stand up and say, "In the name of the Lord Jesus, I forgive you of your sins. I cannot forgive you of any of your sins. It's only the, Holy, the, the only the Lord Jesus who can forgive you of your sins. And if uh, let's get together and let's pray about our sins, but I can't forgive you. But I'll sure pray for you that uh, that you will find forgiveness with the Lord Jesus." Uh, but of course, it's going to be because the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart. Because remember, He's going to be the comforter, but He's also going to be the convictor. So He's going to convict us of sin. And so we see that uh, that there appeared. So the Holy Spirit does these things, and said so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And so we see the source was from heaven. It was the sound of a rush and mighty power, uh, mighty wind, which is the Evidence of the power of God, tongues of fire, which is the presence of God that was distributed. The Holy Spirit touched each one of those persons, not just one or a group, but no, everybody who uh, believed in the Lord Jesus was touched with the Holy Spirit. And that is why uh, Paul tells the Corinthians, as, as mixed up and silly as they were in so many different areas, he said, what? Know you not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? which is in you. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And so we see that uh, the, the Paul really emphasized, and actually the, all the epistles uh, point back to the teachings of the apostles' doctrine that uh, actually we see in Acts chapter 4, the church continued in the apostles' doctrine. And actually, as it was written down, it, uh, the, all the epistles point back to this, the doctrine of, of either the Sermon on the Mount or the book of, book, of, book of Acts. And so we see that he explains what the church is all about. The book of Ephesians, uh, the first uh, three chapters deal with the church as it is the and that we are the temple of God collectively and yet individually. We are. So the temples of God come together to worship the Lord and we become the temple of God, not the building, but the people. And so we see that's uh, all part of collective worship. 
I really praise the Lord. I, one of my men this past week, we were talking, and after meditating on uh, Psalms this past week, he said, you know, I just discovered just how much I need this. And I'm going, praise the Lord. We all need the Word of God. We need to know because it's, it's, it's the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But it's the Holy Spirit who inspired that Word that we now uh, it's the living Word of God, which changes our our souls. It changes our lives. It teaches us of Him. And so we see that uh, the Holy Spirit individually came, and He dealt with each one of us. And notice the effect of that was they began to be, and they were they were all filled. That is, mean they were consumed with the Holy Spirit, and they they, they began to speak in other tongues. Notice as the Spirit gave them utterance. And that's a very important phrase. As the Spirit uh, gave them utterance. And so we see the Holy Spirit gave these people a certain power, a certain gift at this time. And we want to look at that gift this morning because, after all, we said, what was this gift used for and why, uh, why isn't it used today? And so we said, remember, when God changes his order of household, uh, whether it was in uh, Mount Horeb or in Jerusalem uh, on the day of Pentecost, we see that he did some drastic things. He changed things around. Uh, after uh, giving of the law, we know that uh, one of the people that went out and they gathered sticks uh, during the Sabbath and they were killed immediately. You know, but and and we see in the book of Acts how that the church came together, and there was a, a man named Annas, Ananias and his wife named Sapphira, and they tried to cheat the church or t- tried to to deceive the church, and they were killed. Now, folks, we don't have that power today. Now, those who think that we have the Holy Spirit power, the same in Acts chapter two. Uh, as that, then if you start showing me preachers that can uh, just by saying uh, something to uh, a church member walking out the door and they drop over dead, uh, I don't want that kind of power myself. And I don't think anybody would want to come to church here if they thought I had that power. And so you can understand how that God was changing things, but he set examples up. There was only one Nadab and Abihu episode where the Lord struck those priests down. There were priests later on that were more corrupt than they'd have been, uh, by, by you, but that was back when God was changing things, and he was saying, this is, I mean this. And so we see time and time again uh, where when God is changing things, he uses drastic measures, and he uses phenomenon that uh, are not, uh, that don't normally last all the way through. And now the Holy Spirit is still here. But he is not dealing in the same way that he dealt with us in Acts chapter 2. Now, let's define then what tongues are. We notice that he says the effect was that they would begin to speak in tongues. And these were, and one of the things you'll see in uh, the translations, King James and others, every time you see that word unknown, you will see that it's in italics. And italics means that it was added by the translators to give it more understanding. Tongues is a word meaning language. And so let's, and let's look at what, how the Bible immediately defines language. And we read that in the rest of the passage that we see up to, through verse 13. He says, and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews. Devout men. Now, it doesn't mean they were Christians. It means they were devout Jews. They had come from all over the world. Uh, you don't just uh, take a thousand-mile trip over the roads and so forth back, especially 2,000 years ago, unless you're devout, uh, to go to a certain feast. And so they were devout people, devout men and women uh, from every nation under heaven. So we know that were there Chinese there? I mean, you know, there again, God said they were under every nation under heaven. And when the the sound occurred, the multitude uh, came together, and they were confused because they heard them speak in uh, his own language. They must have heard that hurricane that came through. I don't know if they saw the uh, the signs or the uh, the sign of fire, but all of a sudden they started hearing these people speaking in a language, and they then they all were amazed and marvelled, saying to one another. 
Uh, look, are they not all these Galileans? These are a bunch of dumb fishermen. They're not the theologians uh, down here from the temple, but these are a bunch of of guys who really they they're pretty smart guys. They're businessmen, but they're not they're no theologians. And he says, but he says, and how is it that we hear each in our own language? Notice it defines the Bible defines itself in so many areas. So these tongues were their own language. How can these illiterate or these uneducated uh, Jews or uh, Galileans, northern Israel, uh, which was way away, was um, was considered uh, more of a Roman uh, culture than a Jewish culture, which was down in Judah, Judea, and so forth. And so uh, they were, how can these people um, be able to speak uh, our language? And notice he, it goes and it even de- describes these languages, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and those dwelling in Mesopotamia and Judah and Cap- Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, um, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and other parts of Libya uh, and Cyrenae, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. And so Luke is trying to tell us, hey, folks, uh, the, uh, I'm not telling you this is all over the world blandly. I can tell you that, uh, that from eyewitness accounts that there were people from all over the world that heard in their own language. And so we see, he said, we hear them speaking in their own language, their own tongues, the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're drunk, they're full of wine. And so we see that uh, the Bible immediately defines to us what tongues are. And it tells us that they were, that they were, they, that they were, the gift of tongues, if you want to call it that, was for the evangelism of the, the Jews that were there in Jerusalem. Now, over in the book of First Corinthians, now Paul, as he is trying to explain what tongues are, he's got to tell like so many things. Uh, in chapter 13 of First Corinthians, he has to tell us what love is not. And then in chapter 14, he has to tell us what tongues are not. And he said, what they're not used for. And uh, it's interesting as you read the, the great love chapter of uh, chapter 13, he has to say, love is not this and love is not that. Love doesn't think its own. It's not, and so all these things. But in chapter 14, he has to kind of straighten us out with what tongues are. There, notice, now I wish we had, we'll go back and hit these things several times, but just to give you a, a an introduction, look, chapter 14, verse 13, he says, um, now therefore let him who speaks in a tongue and a language pray that he may also interpret. Now in other words, if I could speak to you in an un, that, in a language that is not familiar to me, then, Lord, give me understanding of what I'm saying to you. But he says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but uh, my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? Okay, what, what am I getting at then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I want the Holy Spirit to give me understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will always sing with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of uh, of the uninformed say amen? So if I start talking to you in German, and nobody here speaks German, what matter does it? Same way with Latin. If I start talking in Latin, what, you know, all we're going to have is a ritual if I do that. Uh I don't know what he said, but it sure sounds good. You know, whatever that is, you know. Uh, no, it's got to be something that uh, that people can say, so be it. Amen. I understand. He says, uh, at the giving, uh, how can they, uh, the uninformed, say amen at the giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So if you're all happy in one language, and uh, then you got somebody... Uh, from a different country that's there, uh, they're just confused. And so he says, I thank God, uh, thank my God, I speak with tongues. You know, Paul was multilingual. 
more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that you may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So again, we see that tongues are not for just a normal speaking church. But what are they for then? Turn to look, and let's just look then at verse 20. What were tongues used for in the New Testament beginning of the age? Notice he says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding, however, uh, in malice be babes. In other words, uh, be adults, and yet when it comes to really being angry at people, be like a little child. I mean, you're, you're not wanting to hurt anybody. But in understanding, be mature. And the law is written, and he quotes, uh, um, actually, Isaiah chapter 26. But he says, uh, uh, with men uh, of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. Now, that is Isaiah chapter 26, verse 18. But um, with that, we see then, who are this? He says, I will speak, and this again, as John had prophesied, John the Baptist prophesied the Holy Spirit would come, that he got that actually from Isaiah. And Isaiah says, yes, he's going to speak to this people with other uh, with other tongues, in other words, and more than just Hebrew. And yet, all for all that, they will not hear me. Now, think about that. Think about the prophecy there. Who is this people? I will speak with other tongues to this people. The sign was not to the Gentile, the sign was to the Jew. And so this people, he was going to speak to this people. Who were there at the book or at the day of Pentecost? Notice it says Jews from all over the world. And so we see that these tongues were used, and I'm sure that some of the Jews, and most of the Jews there could probably speak some mixture of Yiddish or whatever, but these people were astounded that uh, they grew up in Phrygia or Rome or whatever, and these people were speaking fluent Latin or Phrygian or whatever language it was there. And so we, and, and they said, hey, uh, it's not only me, but he's speaking to, I mean, I, I'm listening in Phrygian and this person's listening in uh, Cretan or whatever, you know, Arabic or whatever. And how can this be? And so we see that this was a phenomenon that God used as a sign to the Jew that, yes, he was changing things. And so we see that uh, tongues were, uh, the, that the tongues were, first of all, you need an interpreter. What, what use is tongues if the, nobody could understand? Um, that, um, that tongues were assigned to the Jew. And also, uh, notice in verse 22, it says, therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe. We don't need it if we believe, but to the unbeliever. By prophesying, but prophesying is, uh, uh, is not for unbelievers, but uh, for those who believe. But here we see that the tongues were not used. We don't need tongues. If we, this church is full of people that believe, there's no use for the sign of tongues. And it, but, uh, but this was a sign to an unbelieving Jew that this was authentic, and we see this actually in Acts chapter 10 and other places, all through, in fact, you will see all the way through the book of Acts, every time that tongues are used, there's all, there are always Jews present. Always Jews present. So two things you need for tongues. First of all, uh, you need interpreter. If you're going to have tongues, it's a definite language, and it's spoken by somebody who doesn't usually speak that definite language. For instance, I can't speak German, but if the Holy Spirit filled me and I spoke German today, there would be need to be an unbelieving German today here, a German Jew that would, uh, but we could hear and say, "Wow, that that Baptist preacher can speak my language." You know, I mean, it would just startle them to do that. And so here we see that uh, this this was something that God had promised uh, to the Jew. And this was a sign to them. And every time that you see uh, tongues used in the Bible, you will see, except in Corinthians, but you will see that uh, that Jews are present. 
And so we see that tongues then were a sign. This was something, a phenomenon that came, and it lasted for a few years. And actually, you will, you'll see it in the House of Cornelius, and actually the Samaritans later on, that that uh, that had to be very, Peter was unbelievable. I can't believe that, you know, how can these people uh, come to know the Lord? And then the Holy Spirit filled them with the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, okay. And so here we see that uh, other people that uh, came to know the Lord as their as their Savior, and the, the Jews were present. And they said, oh, okay, this is what's happening. And so, again, we see um, that uh, these things through the, and we will try to trace this. Um, and yet, uh, it just to, to get started, it's hard, very difficult to give. It's not like opening up a can of worms, somebody says. I just got you started, and now all of a sudden you say, well, wait, what about this? What about this? Well, we'll have to come to it. But, uh, you know, how long do we preach this morning? And so, again, we're already 45 minutes into this message, and uh, we better uh, get going. But uh, then the other thing, what is the sign of the Holy Spirit then? What are the signs of the Holy Spirit today in a congregation? Well, then we have to turn back. Actually, there's two passages. We'll only look at one this morning. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 is a good passage. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and so forth. But let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 tells us, and it opens up a whole new culture, starting with the family and with the church. And he tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, actually in verse uh, verse 15. Now remember, he said Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 deals with the doctrine of the church, the setup and what it's supposed to do, and it's to bring glory to Christ forever. And then we see uh, the practical part from chapters 4 through uh, chapter 6, and it deals with how do you live within the church. And so notice that he tells us, and at verse 15, he says, seeing then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Okay, so how do I walk in the Spirit? How does my life conform? And we say that word walk in the Bible is the idea that we get in step with the Lord. It, it's our whole new way of living. Uh, when you first get saved, you're a babe in Christ, and you have to learn very shakily one step at a time. But there should come a time in your life as you mature that you don't have to worry about each step. Now, you have to worry about tripping and all that, but uh, but there are just certain things that come automatic or automatically, not to be precise. But uh, then we see that uh, so there are certain things. And that's one thing. That's why I hope people in the sound of my voice this morning, unless you're physically impaired or whatever. And of course, we got uh, reasons for not to have a full congregation here this morning. But uh, I like it when people say, you know, pastor missed last Sunday. And oh, I just felt so bad about it. And I'm going, you know, my you know what I tell you, I'll smile at you and say, good. Why? Because that's the way we should feel. Because it's our walk. We want to gather together. We love the brethren. We know that uh, there's power in the 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 and of course getting together as there was in the day of Pentecost. The people coming together in one accord and praising God together. We need all that, and we need the fellowship. We know that we've passed from death into life because we love the brethren. That should all be part of it. And I hope you miss us this morning. Now I hope you back next Sunday. But you know what I'm saying. And so we see, he says, so then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, be not unwise. Now, that's a very interesting word. And uh, you mothers who want to cover your kids' ears there, that word unwise can actually be translated stupid. Now, we don't want to use that word, but uh, you know, but that is a very strong word. But he says, be not unwise, but understand what the will of God is, or what the will of the Lord is. Okay, so the Lord is telling you and me that we need to know his will. It says, don't be unwise. We'll just go with that word. But he says, be understanding. There it is. The uh, Holy Spirit gave them understanding, gave them understanding. So he says, then, first of all, do not be drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by a foreign substance in which is dissipation. But he says, be, be filled, be controlled by the Spirit or by the Holy Spirit. Now, there's four 
subjective participle phrases here that tell us what are the indications of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice Spirit-filled people speak to themselves, or they're speaking to themselves, uh, to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So first of all, Spirit-filled Christians are singing Christians. And we're meditating. Notice we're singing to ourselves. We get the Word of God, and, and that's why church music and church doctrinal music is so important. Not the worldly stuff that now the world is going after and wanting entertainment. No, but uh, songs that uh, back up doctrine. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot. That was taught me to say it as well with my soul. I mean, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, but now I was blind, but now I see. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Over and over, just songs that should reverberate through our lives. Uh, and others. I mean, there's just a, just a whole range of songs. Uh, not this pablum that we're getting today, but the doctrinal songs that back up Scripture. But you see, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So they're speaking, they're meditating, but then they're singing and making melody. So spirit-filled Christians speak to themselves. They meditate on the Word, even in singing. They make melody to their hearts. And they're singing and making melody in their hearts to the Lord. So they're speaking and singing. And then also they're thankful, giving thanks always for all things. The God, uh, notice, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now notice the progression there. Be filled with the Spirit, but thank God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting? And so again, we're not, we're, the Holy Spirit is with us this morning, but He's wanting us to, He wants to say, that's Him. Worship Him, the Lord Jesus. And so we see that, um, when he says that um, giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father, in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. And then the third, the, the, the fourth thing, the fourth uh, subject, subjective phrase there is submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. So Christians are not narcissists. They seek not their own. They are loving other people. And as a result of that, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And there's joy and peace that come with that. But the rest of those fruits of the Holy Spirit, as we see, actually are social graces. Long suffering, kindness, meekness, all those, are, those are all social graces that God gives us. And so we see that the whole idea of submission is one to another. And that changes the whole grasp of things, changes the whole social order. Now, here in Ephesus, uh, it wasn't uh, a man that uh, was actually in the church of Ephesus. If I was preaching there this morning, there would be about 50% of the people that would be servants or slaves. And there'd be about 50 people that were either businessmen. And if they were quite wealthy or whatever, they would have several slaves. And so, and it, and it didn't matter about the race. It was just, uh, they were slaves. And so you can imagine the cultural divisions that were in those churches to begin with. And then if you were a good businessman and you had a lot of money, then uh, you could stop off at the camp, uh, the temple of Diana on the way home and you had your own uh, retinue or a uh, uh, group of temple prostitutes if you wanted them or whatever else. And of course, that was all in the name of religion. And uh, then you'd go home and you had... Uh, female slaves around, and so, uh, but, the, but then you were married, and that was the one that kept things legal, and that was the way you passed your legal uh, rights to your children and all that. And the Lord Jesus came in, and He said, First of all, wives, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands. The key there is not submit, because He's already said submit, everybody submit. The key word is own. It's hard to be a temple prostitute and a, a faithful wife at the same time, isn't it? It's hard to be, and you can understand all, all the things that go on there. But then, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That means you, if you give your wife totally to your, uh, only to her, then that takes care of all the rest of the social injustices. But then it also says, if you love your wife, you'll love yourself. 
And I always tell uh, girls, be careful. Watch the way that men treat women, especially their mothers and their sisters, because it'll tell you a lot about how they're going to treat you. But, uh, and I tell also, I say, uh, ladies, don't marry some guy that's always you having to prop up because there's a certain thing about a guy's ego that, uh, uh, that he's got to be the leader sooner or later because, uh, God is designed that way and not for you to have to prop him up all the time. And so we get it by, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, there's a series of messages we can preach on. I've, I've preached on these, and many people have preached on these passage. Books have been written on this passage. But then it goes into fathers. And again, fathers and not mothers, but fathers, make sure that you don't provoke your kids to anger. Teach them how to love God. And then owners, okay, you're a businessman. You treat those workers that you have, whether slaves or free, you treat them right. And so the whole social order is being changed. And is it any wonder that uh, the that the church was so instrumental in the Western world dumping slavery and having monogamous marriages? I still remember the one book that oh, I was reading an article back several years ago now about an Olympic lady, a girl swimmer, girl a swimmer, and she was over in a certain part of the world, and uh, the boat or the ferry that they were on capsized. And being an Olympic swimmer, she was going around and all these ladies with the heavy uh, burkas and all these things on and all kinds of other clothes, uh, they were sinking. And uh, she went over to where there were men that got on the boat and they were all getting on the boats. And she actually tried to get some of the women on the boat and the men were throwing them off because only men were to be saved. Women were segregated citizens. And she, and actually they tried to fight her off the boat. And, uh, she would, she understood the difference between uh, the Western culture, which was very very influenced by Christianity, and the uh, and the non-Western. Well, when I say Western, we have to get into boy, you get into this a one-world situation day, and you got all kinds of things. You have to be careful not to say that you're going to offend somebody. But you understand what there was a culture of Christianity where women were honored. I guess is the best way of putting it. And uh, men, even on the Titanic. The one man, that, the several men that were on there, especially even the man who designed the boat, uh, he was condemned for the rest of his life because he saved himself, but there was a lot of women and children that went down with the boat. And so all kinds of things where that whole culture is, hey, we put ladies first. Uh, these days, uh, I, like, I guess I'm just chauvinist, but I still like the idea of opening doors for ladies. I mean, it's bad news these days because when you do that these days, some of them grab their purses, you know, they're worried, okay, what's going on? You know? But uh, but there again, this is a whole culture that that goes around spirit-filled Christians. We are to honor women. We are to honor and to raise children and nurture the nation of the Lord. We are to be honest business people. And we are to be uh, care for those who work for us and work under us. We are to be, we are to be respectful to authority. All these different things that come from being filled with the Spirit. And it changed the whole culture of Rome and Greece and all other places. Now, of course, uh, we know that's always mixed in with the world. And whenever the world gets into the church, uh, the world, the, the church becomes more worldly, but the world never becomes more churchly. It's always that it is the influence of the church upon its society, and nobody can doubt, anybody with any reasonable grasp of United States history can deny the influence that Christianity had on the early, on the early America that we had. Yes, our country, tis of thee. Yeah, uh, we understand that it was strongly influenced by Biblical Christianity. Now, that's, we just, uh, the sad thing about a message like this is all I did was open up the can. I couldn't give you all the worms, but you understand what I'm saying. I mean, this is a whole, I mean, when you, we get back to understanding what the church is for and that the church is whenever we win people to the Lord and we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still and we're to never fear, but only trust and obey. 
And as we obey his word, there's no good thing will he withhold from them who walk uprightly. Oh, do you know the Lord Jesus? He is the answer to the world. Oh, can you imagine if if the, the streets of Chicago were filled with the Holy Spirit and they went and just practiced chapter 5 of Ephesians? It would straighten out most of, uh, how many killings did we have this past week? Over 40 or uh, our shootings. I think it would straighten out a whole lot of things, wouldn't it? If people would just adhere to the Word of God. But the more we throw off the Word of God, the more that we see uh, people going the way of the world and saying, as uh, the leader of the Church of Scotland this past week, which is no longer the true Church of Scotland, uh, was saying, we have advanced past the Bible today, and uh, we look at it. And so uh, he is now leading the church into perversion, and he's, perver- he's perverted himself. So all these different things that we're seeing that people are getting away from the Word, because the Holy Spirit will always lead you to the Word. He will always, why? Because the Word is Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh, and that flesh was Jesus Christ. He, the Holy Spirit will never lead you outside of His Word. He will always lead you to Himself. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. My friend, this morning, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it is He that tells you that come unto me and I will give you rest. That uh, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the but he tells us, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift you want. Not the gift of tongues, not the gift of whatever. But if you have the gift of if you have gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, then everything else will follow. Do you know him? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior? Are you worshiping the true Savior? Not some church or some ideology, but do you know Him? Has the Holy Spirit come and settled in your heart today? Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the preaching of your Word. And there's just so many things that we can say, but we don't have time. But Lord, we know that that's what you mean by here a little, there a little, line upon line, precept upon precept, May this church be faithful in carrying out the teaching and the doctrine of your word. Oh, Lord, may we continue with one accord in the word and in prayer and in fellowship one with another. Oh, Lord, build your church. Build churches around this country that influence their neighborhoods, their families, their relatives. Change this country, Lord, back to or even better in serving you than it ever has before. Thank you for your word now in Jesus' name. Amen.